Okay, hello. Uh, this is uh, the pre-lecture uh, video for the community ecology section, the second lecture in forest ecology, forest biology. Uh, yeah, forest ecology. So um, <clears throat> a couple years ago when I taught this class, I uh, sent around a little um, poll asking people which of these concepts they were familiar with. And uh, some things came back. People said that they were quite familiar with things like primary succession and facilitation inhibition tolerances, succession models, and the idea of climax forests. And uh, some things uh, people came back and uh, with uh, very low familiarity, like phytosociology, uh, Releves, and Braun Blanquet, and some of the more mathematical parts of uh, community ecology, principal components, twin span, etc. So what I thought I'd do today is talk about uh, community ecology and try and highlight some of these uh, things. The white star is there, palynology, tree migration, ancient DNA, uh, our, and then the climate models down at the bottom. We've taught, touched on those a little bit uh, already, so I won't say much about them today. Um, <clears throat> but uh, some of these other star areas we're going to spend a little bit of time on. So uh, here's an outline of the class for uh, this Tuesday. Uh, this is a bit of a history on the nature of a community and uh, ask, is community ecology a subject? So uh, there's been people suggesting whether there is such, such a thing as a community. Uh, and if so, why is it important to forest biology? Um, and the answer to that is classification. And we'll talk a bit about classification systems. And we'll describe uh, community variation uh, with math, some of those mathy things that weren't very familiar to that other group of students. And I suspect not to you guys so much either. And then move on to thinking about how uh, forest ecologists uh, predict change in forests through time. So here's a paper, a quote from a paper by Lawton in 99, Are There General Laws in Community Ecology? And uh, in, in ecology, and talking about community ecology, says the contingency, con the contingency becomes overwhelmingly complicated at intermediate scales, characteristic of com community ecology, where there are a large number of case histories and very little other than weak, fuzzy generalizations. And that, I think, is a fair uh, state of community ecology generally. But he was not talking so much about forests, but any kind of uh, multi-organism interaction. So uh, this is Frederick Clements up on the upper left and Henry Allen Gleason up in the upper right. And during the middle of the 20th century, 1940s or so, uh, there was a great uh, intellectual battle going on, actually 1930s before World War II, um, where Frederick Clements really described communities as sort of a super organism that uh, different species within a community were like organs in an individual's body. Henry Allen Gleason had a, a very different Im impression of communities and felt that there were species individually responding to uh, the environment. Um, this uh, um, Frederick Clements was a very strong personality. Uh, his idea was very appealing. Uh, and as you can see by uh, Henry Allen Gleason in this photo as an older man carrying sheaths of herbarium specimens, uh, he went off to do taxonomy and stopped doing community ecology. And a lot of what they were looking at was uh, things to uh, try and identify how for how plant communities change through time. And so here is a textbook cut of uh, or a picture of, uh, of a sort of a successional sear where you move from a shoreline uh, backwards and that these shelves then are of older and older and older age. And it's supposed to give you some idea of how vegetation develops through time. This happens to be a topo sequence, a sequence across space uh, that uh, is on the order of um, hundreds of thousands to millions of years old. And it's uh, along the north coast of California, the so-called Ecological Staircase Trail at Jug Handle State Reserve. And that photo is some people standing uh, in the pygmy forest. Those, that's the canopy of those trees. Uh, but um, but the many things have been looking at, many people have looked at succession at much more proximate scales. Um, here's a place looking at a topo sequence again, uh, using physically separate locations with different histories to infer patterns of, and mechanisms of succession where direct observation of change is uh, impossible. And this is a glacier bay in Alaska, and there's been a recession of the glacier uh, as depicted by the dates uh, from the early 1800s all the way up to present, and that uh, since the glacier is receding, it's um, providing a new bare ground for habitat, and you can and estimate the age of different forests or plant communities, and then look at those plant communities through time and estimate their age. So there's the glacier, then there's bare ground, there's tundra, then there's shrubs, woodland, and spruce forest as you go back. And the idea then is that 
uh, when you have bare ground, it's very nutrient poor. Only a few tundra plants can colonize that eventually you get shrubs, some nitrogen fixers, the soil enriches and by and, and later on you get uh, woodland or spruce forest and that you can look alongside the glaciers and see uh, this vegetation progression. So that's a classic story in succession in um, uh, plant ecology. But you can also think about a chrono sequence, something where you're looking at the same place through time and looking at and trying to understand uh, vegetation change. And so uh, we were talking last time about how lakes fill in with sediment. And here uh, in the lower right, you see uh, a bog base that's, that's filled in as uh, through time and that you can uh, take a sediment core through that um, stuff that's filling in the lake, count pollen from it, and describe how forests have changed through time. And that would be a, a chrono sequence of vegetation. So there's some very, very famous uh, examples of these things, and that uh, Clements, in thinking this way, had a very orderly view of succession from pioneer, from pioneer communities to climax communities that would be stable through time. And they called it primary and versus uh, uh, secondary uh, succession, and that developed different models for how uh, you, this might happen, either this idea of relay floristics or initial floristic composition, which I'll talk about in a minute, and thinking about how species interacting might facilitate one another or inhibit one another or just simply uh, not interact very much and uh, have tolerance. However, uh, OOPS really refers to here uh, is that as uh, these de um, uh, descriptions got become more detailed and more detailed, people started seeing more and more um, exceptions to them. So, for example, Clements was in Nebraska and Henry Allen Gleason was in the east, and this is mostly a northeastern uh, U.S. kind of uh, approach. And when you but when you look at western forests, for example, you see that fire is fairly frequent; that there's a long fire history, and that fire may be net that these may be disturbance maintained ecosystems. And so, uh, you need they all of a sudden you needed to create uh, different sets of words that uh, might refer to why something wouldn't move all the way through the successional pathway in an orderly fashion. We're not going to talk about any of those terms. People don't use them anymore, really. So maybe succession is a cute concept, but, but forest dynamics is maybe what we're more interested in. And I, I, along these lines, so people thought about those interactions as maybe something like this, this facilitation or inhibition uh, mechanisms could lead to this sort of relay floristic, sound like the, the pictures we saw of Glacier Bay, where one whole community gives way to another community through time, as opposed to something like initial floristic composition, where lots of things colonize, they colonize at random, but that um, uh, different uh, species uh, um, dominate at different periods of time because the environment is... Um, uh, suitable for them. Uh, you can disregard the, the line on the bottom. This is a slide I use for introductory biology. Okay. Meanwhile, over in Europe, they're doing something completely different. Uh, they kind of like the idea of communities as being uh, staid units of vegetation as well. Uh, and, and they've been managing um, their forests for hundreds of years. And so most of them are in sort of some kind of management state. But they think of these things as having a, um, a real identity. And so uh, this fellow, uh, Braun Blanquet, at the Zurich Montpellier, Montpellier School and uh, Einar Duritz in, up in uh, Sweden, um, start thinking about uh, how you would go and characterize these types of communities. And so what they did was they developed this method of uh, releves, where you'd go to a, a vegetation, a uniform set of vegetation, a community, and then find a characteristic spot within that, not random, and then put a plot in it, and and then uh, characterize the species by their uh, abundances. They scored them actually from zero to uh, from a plus, meaning there's something there, up to a seven. They're very uh, dominant, and then they would then classify these community communities one to the other. Uh, by these ranks of abundance. And this is called phytosociology or the sociology among plant communities. And that um, uh, this, uh, well, actually persisted all the way up to the 18, 1980s and 90s in, in uh, places like uh, Germany. So, uh, so they, they published lots and lots of papers like this, Standards for Associations and Alliances 
of the U.S. National Vegetation Classification. Uh, this was actually in 2009. Uh, this is because um, of what we'll get to later is that having these kinds of community designations is very handy. And actually, the phytosociologists uh, developed some really handy ways to look at these things, suggesting that really uh, the regularity of occurrence of species within, within communities, within assemblages, is probably more informative than the abundance of species within these assemblages. And so they uh, look for indicator spe species, and those indicators could come from any strata within the community. And so something might really be characterized by a shrub within uh, a variety of different trees, for example. Okay, and we'll get back to that in a little in a little bit. But in the meantime, how did that whole really tightly linked uh, community concept uh, fall apart? Because that's certainly not how we think about communities uh, at the present time. So a lot of this has to do with a fellow named Robert Whitaker, uh, and he uh, was looking at uh, plant communities in uh, the Western United States, also in the Eastern United States. But he's very famous for uh, looking up and having a, doing a study up in the Siskiyous, uh, where he uh, would look across elevation and moisture gradients and try and describe forests. And he started out, I think, trying to describe where these communities were and how they uh, changed with elevation. Uh, and he also, in the process, uh, developed this method, this plot method of sampling, which we call Whitaker plots, which is uh, shown down in the lower right. Still a very common way to sample forested plots uh, for community composition. But uh, there are these many several, uh, simultaneous revolutions where Whitaker and others uh, were testing some concepts that had been around for a long time, but they really started getting more quantitative about it, about this idea that species were individually responding to the, uh, to the environment rather than co-occurring and, and moving around in, in, um, in a very tightly interlinked, co-evolved um, superorganism. And that succession could be really disorganized, that it didn't work the same way all the time. Uh, and then there's also a revolution towards the quantification of plots and this idea that maybe we should be randomly, randomly sampling because we needed to use statistics and that in order to have good inference, we needed to have a random sample rather than uh, the releve sort of thing where you place the sample just where you think it's a characteristic uh, part of uh, vegetation. <laughs> And so Whitaker did uh, a lot of transects, and, and this is a graph from the Smoky Mountains, where each of these lines represent a different species. And on the left is elevation in feet, in sort of an elevation gradient, and on the right is a moisture gradient. And uh, the argument was is that if this was a tightly uh, co-evolved community, you'd see these curves going up and down in unison, that species would come and go by elevation or by moisture similarly. And what you see instead are species that are, seem to be responding very individualistically uh, 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 against that gradient. Uh, and as I mentioned last time, uh, the paleoecological literature also had a role to play in this and that people were beginning to look at how uh, vegetation changed to space and time uh, and found that these things were moving at different periods of time at different rates. And so we think of this beech and chestnut forest in the eastern United States that um, uh, was there when uh, settlers arrived and that you see that it, it, it was something that was that is really ephemeral on the thousands of years time frame and not something that had been there forever. Similarly, beech and hemlock up in the north uh, northern parts of Michigan and eastern Wisconsin are thought to uh, co-occur quite a lot. And again, they moved at different time and, and um, to back to this area. So hard to think of them as tightly linked, co-evolved superorganism like communities when they seem when individual species seem to come and go. So uh, treating plant communities as entities, what a silly, silly thing to do. You know, we now know that species respond individually to environmental gradients. We also know that these collection of species are, are not uh, highly evolved entities that have been cohesive for millions of years. Yet, we absolutely rely on this idea of communities. Uh, we, can, uh, we can all recognize what, recognize what we mean, more or less, when we say a redwood forest or a subalpine forest or an oak woodland. And it's a very convenient way to talk about ecological entities. And uh, it's, it's just like species, it's really very handy to have entities that we can label and count. And sure, you know, just like species, there are some fuzzy edges and there are species where we think, oh, are these different species? Or are they not different species? It gets a little subjective. And that problem just is just magnified when you talk about multiple species in communities. 
So how do we use this idea of, of community composition? Well, uh, it's been very useful for, uh, in California, we have these California wildlife habitat relationships. And uh, these are then community descriptors to which our wildlife are pinned to say this uh, pine martins will, will uh, occur in these communities and not those communities. So it's a way to identify potential habitat for animals that we care about. Uh, it has been used for habitat typing for things like forest management and uh, forest service. And so uh, when the uh, forests within the forest service will be site typed, like uh, some kind of stand identifier that when there's some kind of dis uh, disturbance, uh, they make management decisions about replanting in that area. And they use the site type, a community classification, uh, to describe what they're going to do. We've used this uh, to look at change in uh, community. So this is uh, Jim Thorne using Wieslander plot data, and this is the uh, the Sierras, um, and that's Lake Tahoe and the elbow of uh, the border of California and Nevada there. And you can see uh, on the on the right, there's a lot less lime green and a lot more purple. And this is just uh, indicating that we've lost a lot of pond lower elevation ponderosa pine to become mixed uh, hardwood um, uh, forests. And so again, these things are convenient classifiers for uh, depicting that change through time, uh, that our natural national repositories of rarity and endangerment uh, has developed a community ranking system so that for communities, uh, a ranking system for communities so that we can ask whether a community type is rare or not. And uh, there's no legislation like an Endangered Species Act, but obviously this is a kind of a candy thing to have, although admittedly a problematic concept. Um, all states are required to have a, a wildlife action plan. And uh, you know, so California, like many other states, uh, linked and did their action plan within communities. So describe what they were going, what actions they're going to take within different communities. So here's a, a table, uh, North Coast mixed evergreen montane forest by 2025 acres where native species are dominant are increased, blah, blah, blah. That they set goals at the community level. And so it's really the level at which we are often managing um, vegetation, which makes it uh, very, very uh, important. Uh, and so <clears throat> Has there been some kind of modern synthesis about communities? Well, sort of. I mean, so we recognize that we can get uh, co-occurring uh, species uh, rather frequently that help us classify things into communities, uh, such as the wildlife habitat relations or CalVeg or Native Plant Society or NatureServe. Uh, they all use these things. We have a national land cover database and land fire uh, that, that, that where you can look up what the community type is for any place in the country. Uh, a guy named Todd Keeler-Wolf, who worked for the state, was uh, instrumental in sort of trying to reconcile methods for how we're going to do this. And he was really very, very clever, uh, did it in a, in a team. But he was pushing this idea of trying to use the good parts of releves and phytosociological methods, along with the good parts of uh, statistical ecology, and, uh, and in trying to identify where you'd put plots and how you'd sample them. And that uh, we then have this, uh, and they want, they, and we've developed this hierarchical uh, um, process for classifying uh, forests. So we could have a very coarse definition: deciduous forest, evergreen forest, mixed forest, uh, and then we can get have lower and lower and lower levels. And so, uh, so that they have this national vegetation classification standard now, and it is uh, has this hierarchical level where you can have um, this upper, middle, and lower level uh, sets of uh, <clears throat> names, and that they go by formation, class, class formation, subclass formation, division, macro group, group, alliance, association. And if you look at this, um, uh, that sounds a little bit like species, genus, uh, family, order, class, uh, etc. that, or class and order, that, um, uh, you'd get in the taxonomy of animals. And uh, to be sure, uh, when phytosociologists started up this process, that's exactly what they were thinking about. They thought of this classification as being just like uh, Linnaeus was for uh, species in uh, making sense out of this mass and jumble of nature. And so, uh, the, you know, and we, and as I mentioned, we use this uh, in lots and lots of different things, and we will identify um, 
uh, species, uh, both plants and animals, as having an affinity with some association or with one, some macro group. And it becomes then useful to understand that this is a hierarchical process of vegetation classification, and that uh, therefore when you say um, that some species is associated with some community, it's good to know at what level are you talking about in terms of that, that community. Okay, so let's see, we're uh, getting close to the end here. Uh, it's 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll try and finish this up in five minutes or so. So uh, the upper levels are mostly based on physiognomy or the, the basic life form of the plant, so class, subclass formation. These are things like shrubland and grassland class or temporal and arboreal for, uh, alpine class, alpine form and meadow formation. So basically what kinds of things grow there. And so uh, and a lot like what you'd see maybe on a biome map. Um, the middle level is, is uh, both physiognomy but also floristic. So we have these macro groups. They're things like Mediterranean California scrub division. But you know, there's lots of different kinds of sh shrub dominated ecosystems in California. And so it still contains quite a lot of variation. Uh, there's the California chaparral macro group and the California xeric chaparral group. So these are uh, dividing these uh, shrub dominated uh, systems up into some different uh, rather uh, uh, groups that still contain a lot of variation in species. And then you get down to the alliance or association, and then you start seeing uh, a shrub community that's defined by an individual species or two, like an Archostaphylus visita alliance, and that's different than, or a uh, Archostaphylus visita salvia sonomensis shrubland association. Now, of course, you can take this all the way down to the ridiculously fine, and so there was a paper that came out uh, that was looking at phytosociology in France, and this is probably 20 years or so ago. I've kind of forgotten the details, but they were looking at the rate at which they were identifying new associations down to that finest scale. And it looked like at, when they were said and done, they'd have more associations in France than uh, of plant, plant associations in, in France than they had plant species in France. And of course, you can do this numerically by having multiple species uh, uh, um, interact with each other in multiple different ways. But it isn't very useful. It's not that, that having a classification system that is that diverse is just not very useful. So most people use something uh, at either an alliance or a macro group level for their classification. Okay, so that's sort of the background and where we brought, where we come up uh, to in terms of forest classification. But there are some big questions that people ask, like, well, how do you get that? How did you decide what was a macro group? How would you know uh, what would how to define one over the other, assuming that you have lots of plot data even? So for under classification, we have these questions of how many groups are there, and how do they relate to one another? How which ones are more similar to others, uh, to some than to others? And is there a rational hierarchy of these communities? And so uh, and it's not surprising. You can use multivariate statistics to uh, put things into clusters or groups. You can use cluster analysis to decide how, which clusters are most closely related to one to the other. And, uh, and, um, and these are the tools that we use for uh, uh, forest classification. You can also describe those forests. We can describe them in terms of richness, abundance, and importance. Uh, importance is a concept that, that isn't really natural unless you're a forest ecologist sort of thing. But the idea basically is, is that if you look, think about a redwood forest, uh, that you have not very many redwood trees in that redwood forest, but they're massively large. And so if you're uh, describing that community by counting up what was the most numerous, uh, redwood would be uh, you know way down the list. If you're... Uh, but that would be a ridiculous uh, concept uh, in thinking and describing that community. But if you're then looking at biomass, then redwood would be the, by far the dominant species, but, um, but that also might not be very uh, characterized everything that you'd like. And so there's this idea of capturing different attributes of commonness, the biomass, and the regularity with which you see things in forests and combining that into some uh, uh, group score that we call importance value. We can think about alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. We'll talk a bit about that. And then we'll talk about forest dynamics and how communities might change through time. And then something about structure and heterogeneity. Now, to frame this thing, I'm posting up a paper. This is the paper. It's by uh, Jennifer Costanza and others. It's from September of this year. And so this is just to show that these are all uh, methods that are, are um, um, uh, in use right now. So this is an empirical hierarchical typology of tree assemblages for assessing forest dynamics 
under global change scenarios. And what they did was they took uh, the forest plot data, forest inventory analysis data, uh, forest inventory analysis data, so 120,000 plots across the United States, and they used the a composition of trees within those plots to do a cluster analysis and uh, get a typology of forest types, name them, describe them, and then they used um, a climate change models uh, or uh, predictions, climate change model predictions of changes in abundance of species at the plot level to say which of those communities are most likely to change and which way they're likely to change. And so I'll go through and use this as an example in um, in talking about these quantitative methods on Tuesday. So it'd be good to have a, a, a look through that paper before we start. Okay, that's it. See you on Tuesday.